Well, good morning. We continue again on our study of the book of Galatians. We've got two more messages left. And uh, so I've been enjoying this study and I hope you have been too. Let's pray as we're starting out. Father, thank you again for your word and for its faithfulness in our lives, your faithfulness in our lives. We're asking now for you to use your word in however you see fit for your glory and our good. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are laws, uh, natural laws that exist that keep things going the way that we understand them to go. Every now and then, supernatural things uh, take place. We think of that when Jesus was walking the earth and how he would, as God, do things that were against nature, uh, turning water into wine. Uh, walking on water, uh, feeding 5,000 or more people from a little bit of food, creating food right before the eyes of his disciples. Those are supernatural things, but there are natural laws that are always in effect. Um, gravity is one of them. Today, one of the aspects of today's message, we are going to be dealing with a natural law a law that you and I understand because it happens. Uh, it's an agricultural rule. Uh, the idea is one of sowing and reaping. It's um, you do this and this will happen. And we see that in the life of the farmer. I was thinking back to the days when I was a kid, I loved reading comic books. Uh, this is one from back in the 60s, uh, Superman uh, comic, and I liked reading Archie's um, Casper the Friendly Ghost and sometimes the superhero um, comics. And inside the comic, there would be these ads for you make money, you get prizes, and you'd sell these American seeds. And what they would do is they'd send you a box of these seeds. They did this with seeds and they also did this with uh, greeting cards. You'd get these and then you'd go door to door and sell these uh, seeds. And as a result of that, then you'd get all these prizes that they have listed here, which were for a kid, this was the greatest thing. Didn't find a lot of success with that. And so uh, we got all different kinds of seeds. And one of the seeds that they would give us is the pumpkin seeds, okay? Now, if somebody bought these and they took the time and they dug a hole and they planted those seeds, this is not what would grow. An apple is not what would grow. A pumpkin would grow. But it seems that in our lives sometimes we think I can sow certain things and other things will show up. This is a natural law. This is what God is trying to get across. Listen to the scripture today from Galatians 6, verses 6 through 10. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So now we continue moving from the testimony of the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians, which is the first two chapters. The second two chapters are theology and doctrine, what he has done, what God has done for all of us. And then the fifth and sixth chapters, which is the section that we are in right now, it is what do we do with it? What do we practically do with what God has uh, done for us? So let's look again. Point number one in the message, by the way, is we share we share. Look at verse 6 of chapter 6. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Now this, 
this does speak of helping, caring financially for those that teach the word. But we can't get stuck on that and that alone. Because he's saying here, these words taught and teach, these are present tenses and they are continual and a habitual action. So that is something that this person is continuing to teach. This person is pouring into your life. These people are doing this. And it's basically take care of those that minister to you. But there's something even more. When it talks about sharing all good things, the word there is koinonia, and it means fellowship. Uh, the word teach there is tied to the same word in the Greek that we get the word catechism. So there is a regular, steady teaching of the word of God. And so what do you do? You give them or share with them all good things. And what does that mean? That word there is agathos, and that is the good things that God has given you, whether it be um, the change in your life, whether it be that you heard what that teacher, that preacher, that person that poured into your life said, that you would grow up. Remember earlier in the chapter when I was talking about bearing one another's burdens and restoring somebody that had fallen? These are people that uh, have poured into your life and mine, even in the hard times. And they've been there. And the heart's desire of the Apostle Paul is that you would not stay stuck if you were at one time or someone that was carrying these heavy burdens maybe you had fallen maybe you had messed up and then god does this work and you're restored he's saying grow up now move from the milk of the word to the meat of the word that you would become spiritual as he talked about in verse one that person that is spiritual and restoring somebody else since you've been restored since somebody has poured into your life, it's time for you to be a person that ministers to others so that you would move to a place of maturity so that you would ultimately be someone who teaches. Not everybody's gonna teach obviously uh, up front, but you can teach with your life, you can teach with your testimony, you can teach with your actions, you can teach with your gifts, all those different ways. And so you're sharing with the one who taught you good things that, that even, let's say a teacher moved away or a teacher or you moved away, that they would hear about you and you'd be like, wow, that, what you, what happened in that person's life? They're such a blessing. That's the prayer of the apostle Paul. So that you would move from infancy to maturity and be a burden bearer it's just just such an encouragement something good to keep in mind then we come to point number two we sow s-o-w we sow look at this verse seven this is a famous verse it's a powerful verse it's the verse that when i was starting the message today i was using that natural law and so we've moved from the fruit of the spirit which is agricultural and now we're going to talk about sowing and reaping. Look at verse 7 with me. He says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Wow. That whole idea of being deceived. None of us like to be deceived. I know every now and then we watch a magic show. There's something about... Um, watching a magic show and you're like, that's, that's entertaining. But even then, there's a part of you, how did they do that trick? How did they do that? How did the Statue of Liberty disappear? How did that happen? Um, so down deep, we want to know the secret because none of us likes to be deceived. And uh, take a look at the hidden ball trick in baseball. This really is a picture of um, being deceived. Up by Jay to center. Holiday fly to deep center. And he's out. How about that? Helton faked him out. The old veteran acted like he threw it back to the pitcher, kept it in his back pocket, 
Carpenter was off the bag and he tagged him. Take a look here. Uh oh. Boy, would that be frustrating. When you think about the fact of when we mess up, when we fall for something, not all of us do it in a situation where there's thousands of people watching on TV. So I can really pity uh, that gentleman who stepped off of first base and got tagged and then the inning ends and he looks really stupid. But God warns us to not be deceived. That whole idea of deception and deceiving, it's an interesting word. It comes from planao and that's the word that we get the word planet from. And plan, planao means this, to wander around. So when they would look at the planets back in the day, the Greeks, when they look at the planets, they would look at them as wandering around through the sky. They would look at it as there's really no rhyme or reason to it. But the reality is, obviously we know there's rhyme and reason to it. But that's where the word planet came from. So planao means to wander around or to be led astray. And it was a term uh, that means that this person is wandering away, they're, to, they're being led astray, and that's what deception is. Listen to how many times we are warned not to be deceived and what we're warned not to be deceived about. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. So first of all, he's saying, don't think that you're all that because that's deception. And so if we, we are a person that thinks we've got things figured out completely, uh, there's a problem. We can be easily deceived. And why is that the case? Because we have a deceitful heart. There's a famous verse, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick or wicked who can understand it? And so that's our heart. That's, that, that's the heart that we have. And so we have a heart that can deceive us. That's why when you ever hear, hear the statement, follow your heart, I'm always thinking, oh, that's such a dangerous thing to say. Because my heart will lead me down bad roads. I want to follow the Holy Spirit. And then Obadiah, verse 3, Obadiah only has one chapter to it or it's one section there and so verse three it says this the pride of your heart has deceived you you who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling who say in your heart who will bring me down to the ground so there was these people back in the day and obadiah is a prophet and he comes to them and he thinks you you think you're at there you think because you're up in these rocks, they lived in these cliff dwellings and, it, and many armies could not get to them sometimes, but Obadiah knew that if God wants to get a hold of a group of people, at any time he can do that. He's saying, your heart is arrogant. Your heart is uh, self-protective, it's self-promoting, it's self-fulfilling, it's self-defending, and that pride is that is the primary sin and that is selfishness so you have you and i have selfish hearts and we can spin things our way and so our heart can deceive us and as long as we're still here in this world we have a deceitful heart we can fall for things and james chapter 1 verse 22 says this but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So he's saying, we need to understand that I have to un know that I can deceive myself and I can hear the word of God, I can look at it and do nothing about it. And think to myself, because I know the truth, that's enough. And that's self-deception. He goes on and he says in verse 26 of the same chapter, chapter one, he says, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. So if I can't control my tongue, if I can't control my words, 
I'm in big trouble. And this self-deceit is a problem for everybody. And it uh, makes us wonder sometimes, what, how will I ever figure this out? And you need to understand that we don't just battle this world. We don't just battle ourselves. We have an enemy. And in the book of Revelation, uh, God points at this. Revelation 12, verse 9 and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He is thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And so we have this one that is a, the, the, a father of lies. He's a liar and he's the father of lies. And so he deceives us and we can fall for it if we are not aware of of the truth and the truth is Jesus Christ. It's not your truth and my truth or how I feel about things, it is the truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. He goes on in Revelation, he says, Revelation 20 verse three, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. And so that's a future day, but this way, he, during the millennial kingdom, he's locked in and he can't deceive anymore because he's a deceiver and he can deceive the whole world. And if you and I watch the news and we see what's going on, sometimes you're like, how can somebody believe these things? How can uh, a person look at the situations that are arising in different situations in this day and age in America, on a country that many would think is a Christian nation and we're not, we're post-Christian. We, uh, and you watch the news and we cannot be surprised that there is deception going on. Like, but, oh, well, maybe, maybe they just get this fact. Maybe if we just get this candidate, maybe if we just get, it won't, we're just managing sin. It's ju that's just what's going on. And obviously I'm going to vote for the candidate that I believe is going to be the most lining up in their programs toward what God would want. But ultimately, God's the one in charge and I need to rest in him. I'll do the best I can with the, the politics of the day. But I know that when it comes to truly things getting taken care of, it's the kingdom of God, and I need to pray toward that end. And then listen to this in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. So he knows that we could be deceived about this. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And so I need to have an understanding that I can be deceived. So he says, I don't want you to deceive, be deceived. Do not be deceived about who's a true believer. And we can be deceived about that. We can look at different people and go, are they a believer? Well, they said they prayed this. And then you look at the fruit of their life and it's continue year after year. Yeah, but they prayed when they were five years old, but nothing in their life communicates that. That I have to think to myself, I don't wanna be deceived about this, okay? I don't make a final judgment about them. I'm always praying for each and every person, but I don't rationalize this away to make myself feel better. And then he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, do not be deceived, so I can be deceived again about this, do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. And so he's saying, don't kid yourself. If you associate with bad company, they corrupt your morals. And so don't be deceived about that. And so if, you as a young person and 
you're hanging around somebody that it isn't good. Every time you spend time with this person, it isn't good. You see things that show that something's a problem here. Those are red flags and it's going to lead to something bad. Look at Ephesians 5 verse 6. All these verses are saying don't be deceived and so each one of these things is his way of saying you, you and I can be deceived about this. Let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So he's saying, don't partake with that person. And you know that you have a propensity to be deceived. And so we need to biblically look at what God calls for us to do. We need to have wisdom. He says, I don't want you to be deceived. So by the time we get to chapter 6 of the book of Galatians, after all the things that we've heard Paul's testimony, we've heard him confront Peter, we've heard him confront the Galatians. Don't be foolish. Why are you, so, why are you acting in such a moronic way, literally? Um, I'm perplexed by you. I, I, I just don't get what's going on yet. You, you know the truth and you keep doing this. It's because you've been deceived. A group of people came in and they started saying, yeah, Jesus says, but you better do this too. And that's messing up the gospel. And there's a lot of extra gospel being thrown around even today. If you don't line up with this, then you're not going to be saved. This is the most important thing. And you pick it, whatever the thing is. Right now, there's, there's, there's different issues that are coming up. That this, is the, this is the worst sin and we need to deal with it. Okay, We get taken care of that one. Next week, there'll be another one. Instead of going, what is the gospel? And the gospel is this, Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And so he says in this verse, let me read it to you again. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. And so we have an understanding that there is sowing and there is reaping. There are seeds and if you're sowing stingily, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you'll reap abundantly. So there's all different things that we can look at when we think about this sowing and reaping. And it's interesting, this whole idea of, I plant these seeds, I shouldn't be surprised when this pops up. I want you to stop and think for a moment. Every religion touches on this. I'll just mention two in particular. In Greek mythology, they had someone named Nemesis that would show up and it, he would deal with somebody that was doing something they shouldn't be doing. Nemesis would show up and make their life miserable because of something they did. And so they sowed something and then they reaped something. And so even in the Greeks, in their minds that are not enlightened by the scriptures, they would go, yeah, that, that happens. The, the, this you did this and so nemesis is going to do this hindu religion and it's a it's a it's a word that we use constantly in our culture today and it's a word called karma it is i do this and this happens i do this bad thing and down the road karma uh, something bad's going to happen and then so, you know i do something good and something good happens well that's the world trying to make sense of a natural law. And a natural law transcends to a spiritual law. And that is this, what you sow, you reap. Billy Graham tells a story about this young man who had been to told over and over and over again by his father about the, pumpkin, uh, about the watermelon patch. Don't eat watermelons from this, they're not ripe yet. And so he would sneakily go and get watermelon. And uh, after he did that, he would eat behind the shed. And uh, the problem was that a little while later, 
his father called him and said, have you been eating watermelons? Oh no, he's lying about it. And his dad takes him over, hey, and look behind the shed and there's, a, there's a watermelons growing because he had spit the seeds back there. That's the principle. What you sow, you reap. And God wants you and I to take seriously that if I walk in the flesh, from the flesh, I'll reap destruction. If I walk in the spirit, from the spirit, I'll reap life everlasting. And that's the prayer. That's the desire. Let's keep going. Look at verse 8 of chapter 6 as we continue through this book. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And so that word for talks about two different kinds of fields in which one may sow. You cannot sow in both fields and do that at the same time. Sometimes people think that they can play that game with God, but it doesn't work that way. You are either continually sowing in the field of your flesh or you are continually sowing in the field of God's spirit. And God is saying, I, I want you to invest in what's eternal. And that word corruption there, it's harvesting negative consequences that may even include death. Eternal life there is character and quality of reaping heavenly rewards in eternity. And so what are you investing in? And the beauty of it is once I get saved, eternal life begins right there. And I move from there and I be a person that desires to walk with God and trust God and be faithful to God. Point number three. We stand. We stand. Look at verse 9. And this is such a good verse to hear, especially today. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I'm telling you, it, it can be draining because it takes so long. Remember the days when, as a kid, we had this in our school, where you'd get the styrofoam cup, you, they put dirt in it, you planted a seed in there, and then you brought it home. Or you kept it at school, but you kept it by a window there. You kept it so that it was getting light. You'd water it every now and then. And it seemed like it took forever if you kept watching it. If you kept looking at it, you'd be like, when is this? And, and the temptation would be you'd want to dig it up again. But you, you had to be patient, almost to the point of, I'm just going to water it every day. I'm just going to make sure it has the light that it needs every day. But I'm not going to be watching it the whole time. And then later, something grows up. And you're like, hey, it happened. It, it finally grew. And that's what happens. The deception about that is this. When it comes to sinning, if I'm planting seeds concerning sin, it takes a while. Sometimes it could be immediate, but usually it takes a while. And you don't know, but you've planted it, you may have nurtured it, you may have even watered that. And then later it grows and you're like, what did I do? It, it showed up in ways that were like, so, oh, what did I do? But this verse, is more of an encouragement to those of us, the, the, all of us, that desire to walk with God. And we say, I'm planting seeds in the lives of people. I'm planting, which is the most important thing, um, and in, in our community, in our church. And sometimes it just seems like it's taken forever. Those of you that are working with children, those of you that are working with youth, those of you that are working with people that it's like, when is this going to move on? When is this going to be something where this person grows up? And you don't realize what God is doing. It's, a, it's an amazing process of what he's doing. And to trust him. 
and that down the road you look and you go, wow, what God did in this person's life. And it was, it was the faithfulness of God. And so you took the seed and you cast it out and you trusted him for that work. And then he gets the glory because you do know that there's times where you've invested in certain people and you thought, man, this person is always gonna be, and then, hmm. And then there's other people you invested a little bit in, or you invested them in, and you didn't know for sure. And then later you're like, wow, what? God did. I feel like that's what he did in my life. That there were people that invested in me and entrusted the gospel to me in the salvation experience, but also in the sanctifying experience. Those patient children's church workers, those patient Awana leaders, those patient youth leaders, those patient uh, teachers, college professors, that poured into my life, my patient wife, um, patient um, deacons and elders that I've been involved in, patient congregation. And it's a work of God. And if there's any good you see, that's God. If there's any bad you see, that's me. And I want my, my prayer is that we, um, when you look at sowing, you understand that it goes full circle. God will bless and he'll prosper as we desire to stay focused on his word and obey it. Let's be people that do that. So let's not quit. Please do not quit. You may be so tempted to throw in the towel. Don't quit. Um, verse 10, as we finish up this, chat, uh, this uh, section for today. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So he wants us to think about the fact that we have opportunity and that speaks of a fixed and a distinct moment in time. And the good there, it's all kinds of good, that which is moral and that which is spiritual. And so as we're wrapping up, let me ask you this question. What field are you working in? What field are you working in? I'd like to ask you a few more questions. Can you think of uh, times in your own life when sowing to please your sinful nature has forced you to reap destruction? This, this principle that we've been talking about today, have you seen it play out in your life? I know I have. Uh, the times where I'm like, I dug a deep hole there and uh, I, I, put myself in a situation and wow to come back from that thank you for the grace of God but have you seen it I'm telling you those kind of things to keep in mind those are the kind of things that keep you humble keep me humble and keep me desiring to minister to others because I've been ministered to and then how are you reaping to please the spirit in your specific set of God-given circumstances how are you reaping to please the Spirit in your specific set of God-given circumstances? And then last question, how have these verses motivated you to do good to all people? And are there any particular changes the Spirit is moving you to make? And remember, he says the first group of people that we need to think about helping are those that are part of our church family. Not just the people that are out there, those people need help, but ultimately how are people in our church family doing? And it's such a blessing to see how that's playing out in our church family. I like how Chuck Swindoll wraps this up. He says, the spiritual life is anything but passive. Paul said to the Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We see that in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. God saved us. He is shaping us into the image of his son. He is maturing us, but that doesn't mean we're a passive member of this process. Yes, it's ultimately up to God whether he allows the farmer's crop to come in, 
but what the farmer would neglect sowing, tending, and reaping, presuming upon God to bring in the crop anyway. Is there any part of your spiritual life that you've given up on or stopped putting effort into? And if so, what is it? And my encouragement is to you, don't grow weary in well-doing. Parent, don't grow weary in well-doing. Young person, to your friends, and you desire to reach them for the Lord, you desire to pour into their life, don't be weary in well-doing. Teacher, don't grow weary. Ministry leader, don't grow weary. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. I'm asking you now, God, that you would use your word in how you see fit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.